Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the wildlife webinar with Latino Outdoors and Midpen. If you are looking for the wildlife webinar, you're in the right place. <laughs> you're joining us for a free virtual presentation of the wildlife of Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District and beyond. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. Please use the chat to let us know where you're tuning in from. You can share your name with us. And a friendly reminder as a show of appreciation for you all joining us live today, uh, we have uh, two giveaways to, to provide for folks who are joining us live and comment in the chat box. So we have a pair of binoculars to help you all in your outdoor adventures to get a closer look at some of the wildlife. So, so please, please, please uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. We'll keep an eye out on the comments. I see Los Gatos, so not too, that's Bay Area, nice. Thank you. Keep letting us know where you're tuning in from and welcome and thank you again for joining us live. Well, I'll start introducing myself. Um, my name is Aurora Perez. I'm with Latino Outdoors. I'm the San Francisco Bay Area Regional Coordinator and the Latino Outdoors mission is really to inspire and connect and engage with the Latino communities and all communities of all backgrounds in the outdoors to really embrace uh, culture and, and family uh, as part of the outdoor narrative and ensuring that our history and leadership and presence is really valued and represented. And so if you wanna learn more about Latino Outdoors, please check out the website at latinooutdoors.org. And if you wanna connect with us regionally here in the Bay Area, we do have a Facebook group that you can join and an Instagram page that you can follow. And that's really where we'll post a lot of upcoming events that either we're hosting or community partners are. So feel free to follow us and join that group to keep updated with what we're doing here in the Bay Area. And just a couple other things about Latino Outdoors is that there's three major programs within Latino Outdoors. And the one we're most known for is the Vamos Outdoors, which is Let's Go Outdoors. And that's really just about inspiring outdoor engagement. And as you can see in these photos here, um, some of these photos are showing litter cleanups. They're showing a hike in the redwoods and backpacking trips. And a couple of these were in partnership with Midpen as well. And so we, we do lots of outdoor engagement, whether it's fishing, hiking, climbing, anything that gets the community outdoors. We also have our Yo Cuento program, which translates to I tell, I say, or I matter. And that's really what it's about. It's about amplifying and sharing people's stories and making sure that you know people are heard and that those stories are represented in the media as well. And our third program is the Crecemos Outdoors. And that's really about fostering outdoor leadership within the network of Latino Outdoors volunteers and the community as a whole. And so Latino Outdoors really is, is volunteer driven. There's chapters all across the United States and it's all made possible due to volunteers donating their time and knowledge and energy to creating events and outdoor opportunities for the public to join. And so we're always super grateful and appreciative of all of our partners, all of our participants, and of course, all of our volunteers. And I want to introduce and show appreciation to MidPen. Uh, you know, we've been partners for several years now, and we put on outdoor engagement events. We put on virtual events like the one we have today. And um, I'll let them introduce themselves as well. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Sydney Bieber, and I'm a public affairs specialist here uh, with the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, which is also known as MidPen. And MidPen helps plants, animals, and people thrive throughout the greater Santa Cruz Mountains region by preserving a connected green belt of over 65,000 acres of public open space. That's over 100 square miles. And our mission can be summed up in five words to preserve, protect, restore educate and enjoy. And MidPen is a unique public agency. We're a special district created in 1972. It's our 50th anniversary this year. And uh, it was created by a grassroots voter initiative to protect the green foothills of Santa Clara County originally. 
A few years later, Santa, San Mateo County voters expanded the district on the peninsula side. And then in 2004, on the coast side, we managed 26 open space preserves with 245 miles of trails for you to explore free of charge all year long. And each of the dark green areas on this map indicate where a mid pen preserve is. So uh, you can check out our website, openspace.org for where to go, what you'll find out there, how we work to manage the land and even ways you can enjoy nature at home, like through this and other virtual presentations. Awesome. And I'll thank turn you. it over to Aurora for a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Sydney. Uh, so I wanted, you know, we wanted to start off this presentation with some tips to observing wildlife. In a little bit, we'll learn about some of the species found at Mid Peninsula and beyond. And then our focus for the presentation will be presented by Matt on mountain lions. And so, a little tips before we get into that is, you know, for observing wildlife, we don't, you don't need to travel far. You don't. Uh, need to have any fancy equipment. Really, wildlife is all around us, whether it's in our backyard, in our neighborhood, under a log, it can be found everywhere. Um, so some tips to observing wildlife, the best times for observing most animals are in the morning or in the evening. That's when most animals tend to be most active. So the chance of us seeing anything is increased. Um, sometimes even overcast days are really cool for, for nature photography and wildlife photography because there's less shadows and so you're able to really hone into those details, see, you know, the patterns, the beaks, and some of those finer details that uh, might not be so, so obvious other times. Um, when observing wildlife, you want to try to be as quiet as possible when you're on the trails. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear wildlife before you can even see it. And that happens a lot to me, especially with birds. I'll hear a song or a call, and I'll start looking and being like, where is this coming from? <laughs> so you want to make sure you know you're being as quiet as possible so that you have the opportunity to hear those sounds. And also, an animal might not hear you coming and they won't scurry away quite yet. So you have that opportunity there as well. Uh, another important one for, for life in general is practice being patient. <laughs> um, and that also comes in handy when observing wildlife. Uh, it's happened to me when I've gone out whale watching that I'm not patient enough. And as soon as I turn away, the whale appears. And uh, when I turn back to look for it, all I see is that spout. Uh, so patience is definitely very important, you know, taking the time to to just sit there for a while or and make observations um, because it might come when you least expect it. And so being able to practice that patience is a really key uh, tip. Um, and, you know, most animals are have some sort of camouflage with their surroundings as well. Um, and so being able to take the time to notice that that swift uh, change in shape or that little movement is really important too. This happens to me a lot with, with banana slugs. I'll be walking and uh, I'll look down and and sometimes banana slugs look like a leaf or you know, when there's lots of bay laurels in the environment, they're very slender and so are banana slugs and they're kind of similar in color too. So uh, taking the time to look all around up around you and even on the bottom of the ground on the trail. So uh, looking at those swift little movements or ch shape changes really help identify some animals sometimes too. Um, some other tips to observing wildlife is picking a good spot uh, and knowing what you're looking for and where and when you're most likely to see it. And so if you want to see an animal that is known to be in an environment where there's water, then picking the right spot would mean picking a preserve or a space where, you know, there's lakes or ponds or a river. And knowing what you're looking for can look like a lot of ways. Uh, sometimes you can look up the park's website beforehand and you get a good sense of what animals are already present at that park. And so you, you have more of an idea of what you're more likely to find. And then it's also quite nice to take with you on the day of some sort of field guide. So if you do encounter a really cool animal that you were trying to look for, or even if you weren't, uh, you have that field guide with you so that you can try to, to identify it on the spot there as well. Um, 
And, you know, sometimes you might not see an animal, but you'll see some of their tracks. And so that's another really cool tip to observing wildlife is that you can learn a lot about an animal's tracks. Uh, it signals that an animal was there. Uh, sometimes I see always lots of scat on the trail and it's always really fun to kind of like poke around and be like, oh, I think this animal really likes eating berries or this animal ate something furry or this scat looks really fresh. So they might still be around in this area. So looking at those little details and, and, and tracks and signs of a wildlife is, is an observation in its own and, and it, it can help create some, a sense of of trends, you can, if you notice a trail that has lots of scat, then you can kind of guess that maybe that animal is using that trail as a corridor themselves or as a trail to get from point A to point B. And so it's really cool to notice some of those little things. Um, you wanna make sure you don't assume that young animals are abandoned as well. <laughs> so that's a big one. Uh, you know, it might be that their parent is around the corner and they're just waiting for you to leave so that they can get back to their young. Uh, so when encountering any when encountering any sort of young young animal, you you know when it comes to like bears, you definitely know you don't want to be near those. But even at smaller scale animals, it, it's still a good idea to to not uh, assume that the animals are abandoned and interfere. Uh, if you feel like you want to do anything, you know you can call a park, call a ranger, let someone else know if you notice something bizarre or weird or you think an animal is hurt or abandoned. And by just letting them know that's that's already a great step and then they know they would know how to react to that. Uh, another tip is that every park is unique and has its own guidelines. So again, just knowing before you go to, to any park what kind of tips they have for observing wildlife. It might be that some parks have seasonal trail closures because they're protecting sensitive habitat. So making sure you're not interfe interfering with those trail closures and um, you know planning ahead and, and having an alternate route in case the trail you were intending to hike is closed for some reason. And always, 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 you know, maintaining that wildlife uh, viewing distance. If you're close enough to take a really cool selfie with an animal, you might be too close. <laughs> so making sure you're respecting the wildlife space. Uh, and again, if you want to get a closer look, that's why there's uh, sometimes you can use binoculars or really cool like zoom in cameras to get you that sense of getting a little closer without actually physically getting close to the animal that would then put yourself and the animal in danger. And the last tip that I have is um, starting a wildlife diary. And so that can look like an actual like paper and pen. And it would just, you know, be you documenting what animals you're seeing at what parks and allowing you to create your own charts and, and trends to see what animals you're seeing when and where. Uh, I use iNaturalist a lot. And so, you know, that's a, a phone app that allows me to document some of the plants and what, wildlife that I'm seeing as they're in parks and help me identify them. And it's always really fun to then go back and look at the observations that I've made and see where I made those. So those are some of the tips that I have for observing wildlife at Midpen Preserves and any parks or any space outdoors. <laughs> um, I wanted to jump in again and go over a little bit of some of the wildlife that you can find and experience at Midpen. And so these are some of the fall migrants and, and winter visitors of the park. And I thought they were super cute. So I wanted to share them all with all of you. <laughs> um, this first one here is the ruby crown kinglet. So it's that smaller bird on the right uh, top corner of your screen. And it has that ruby crown, but it's not always super uh, obvious and it's definitely mostly on males. And so they're really small uh, birds that, that like to be in woody areas and are mostly insect eaters. Uh, then there's also cedar waxwings, which are that bottom right picture. And those arrive in flocks and, and they love enjoying the winter berries. So if you're ever on a trail or see a shrub or a tree with lots of berries, it might be that that's perfect habitat for the cedar waxwings. Um, and then this ruddy duck, it's you know found near ponds and bay sides and it has that really cool beak and it dives for shellfish and, and insect invertebrates and, and plants as well. Um, so those are some of the birds that you'll find at Midpen, but there's lots of different wildlife and 
These are some of my favorites. I love newts. I think newts are awesome. I love all salamanders. But what I learned while doing research for this presentation is that there's two different types of newts that look very, very similar. Even looking at these two pictures, I still have a hard time recognizing which one is which one. Um, but there are some key characteristics here. Um, and I think the one that would be uh, most helpful in identifying them is the way they lay their eggs. So the California newt here on the left lays its eggs in masses and the rough skin newt lays eggs singly. So that, but that might be hard if you're not seeing the newt while near its egg mass. Uh, and, but if you ever see the newt in its defensive posture, that's another different characteristic that helps identify these two. The California newt one, uh, the tail bends back and sticks straight backward when the newt adopts its defensive posture. And the Ruskin newt, the tail curls over when the newt adopts its posture. So it's little characteristics that differentiate the two, but they're definitely very uh, popular, especially during wet and foggy seasons. And so we're very likely to see them in these upcoming months, hopefully, uh, if we get you know rain and, and a wet season. I know I definitely have seen them at Midpen already. So um, you, know, you always wanna be careful uh, I think November through March is their like migration and breeding season. So there might be an increase in newts. Uh, so it'll be really cool to keep an eye out for those. And then a couple other uh, wildlife that I wanted to introduce briefly were the American badgers and the burrowing owl. I've been obsessed with badgers for a long time and my life goal is to hopefully see one one day. I know they're nocturnal, so the likelihood of me actually seeing one is a little low, but I am hopeful. Um, so the American badger is a species of special concern in California, uh, and but they are known to live in the grasslands of many midprint preserves and, and the burrows that they make then become winter homes for the burrowing owls. So I think it's a super interesting, cool relationship that the two have. And Midprint did a wonderful job doing research, setting up wildlife cameras to learn more about the the relationship between these two and learning their population. And so they do have a document available to the public. If you were to visit that URL down in that screen, uh, you can learn more about the study that Midpen did and learn some of the results between the relationship of these two. So I know that was all very, very quick to some of the wildlife of Midpen, but we really wanted to have a focus, a species focus. And so I'm passing it over to the expert, um, Matt, a wildlife bio biologist with MidPen to give us that presentation. And I'll give Matt a little bit of an uh, introduction and then we're going to turn uh, it over to him today. MidPen, uh, you may or may not know, uh, does employ a number of uh, biologists that work in our natural resources department. And they are um, by far one of the uh, greatest group of dedicated, uh, intelligent, uh, resourceful, all sorts of those things. I had great notes written about Matt and then I closed that window so I don't have them anymore. But I've worked with Matt here for a long time. He is an expert on, um, or he wouldn't want me to call him an expert. He has a wide, wide depth of knowledge about mountain lions, bats, newts. He, uh, you know, specializes in sort of the animals uh, that we work with and protect here at MidPen, and I'm going to turn this over to him and uh, let him share his screen. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we'll get to the uh, part that you probably all wanted to hear here. All right. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you, Sydney. I, I like that you didn't have notes and you just got to wing it, and I got to hear what you really, <laughs> really think about me. No, you know. <laughs> Uh, and Aurora, I have to compliment you on all your wildlife tips. Those were spot on. Um, and I really appreciate the idea of just being mindful and present when you're out there. Um, I think that's the, the best tip of all. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. And OK. Sydney, can you see? See my, pre my presentation? I can see your presentation and it looks perfect. All right. Excellent. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here um, listening to Aurora detail uh, 
the description of Latino Outdoors and all the good work they do um, just made me feel very honored to be able to be here tonight and uh, present this information to everybody that tuned in. So uh, thanks for having me and thanks to everyone who's here. Um, I noticed in the comments, we got a lot of folks from the Bay Area, um, which is great because uh, where I work and where I grew up was the Bay Area. Um, I grew up in Santa Cruz and still live there today. And I'm lucky enough to work in the Santa Cruz mountains uh, for mid -Ben. So my name is Matt Sharp Cheney. I am a wildlife biologist, as Sydney mentioned. Um, and I am the lead mammologist, which is uh, someone who studies mammals um, with the natural resources department. And so what that basically means is I spend a lot of time with bats uh, wood rats and big cats like the mountain lion that we see in this image here. Um, and that is, of course, the topic of today's talk is mountain lions. Um, one of the species that I spend uh, the most time on uh, with my work at MidPen. And a lot of my work boils down to, uh, oftentimes, at least with mountain lions, uh, safety and potential conflict between people and mountain lions. And we'll talk a bit, of course, about how beneficial mountain lions are. And I really want to emphasize that we love seeing mountain lions on the landscape. They are essential to the healthy functioning ecosystems that we find in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, but on occasion, there can be some conflicts. So I do want people to be aware of what to do if you see a mountain lion. Um, but not to be uh, overly afraid of them or unjustly afraid of them. Um, so today's talk, we'll learn a bit about some mountain lion ecology. We're going to play a little game together uh, where you will be able to guess what species we're, we're seeing. I'll show some photos. And you can decide if it's a mountain lion or maybe something else. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about how MidPen protects mountain lions and things that you can do to stay safe while you're recreating outdoors um, in areas that mountain lions might call home. So um, we're backtracking just a little before I go to this one. Uh, so start off, let's do a little exercise just to make sure everybody's awake and alert and engaged. I know it's getting close to dinner time and people are finishing up maybe a long day of work. Uh, but I'd like us to look at two photos. So the first photo is the one that we see before us right now. Um, and we've got a beautiful mountain lion kind of walking towards the frame of the photo. Seems like it's in an area that probably isn't frequented by people. I see a lot of leaf litter on the ground. I see a lot of vegetation. So if this was a trail that was driven or walked or ridden on bikes quite a lot, you probably wouldn't see those things. Um, I also see like a little scat kind of right behind the mountain lion. Um, and what I want you to do is think about uh, this image and kind of what feelings it stirs up for you. Um, does it make you afraid? Does it make you excited? Does it make you interested? Um, what do you think of it? And I want to, you to compare those feelings with the next image that I show and kind of think of whether or not one seems more alarming to you than another. So this is photo number two, and this is a beautiful shot. Uh, this was taken at Rancho San Antonio in 2015. And here we've got this mountain lion that is sitting um, on a trail that is definitely frequented, right? We don't see all that vegetation and leaf litter. Um, so this is somewhere that people are often walking. Um, and it looks very relaxed, right? It looks very at ease um, in that situation, in this, you know, out during the day on, on a trail um, where the public might be. So um, our little exercise is for you to tell us, and you can either just think about this in your head and decide which one you think might be more alarming to you. And if you don't think either of them are alarming, that's fine too. Um, and then if you would like, you can type it out in the chat. And we can look at that later. So keep this in mind. We'll circle back to these two images at the end of the talk. Um, and I'll sort of tell you what I think. All right, so let's move into some mountain lion ecology. So the scientific name or Latin name for mountain lion is puma concolor. And that basically means lion or cat of one color. And that's talking about the fur of the mountain lion that for 
you know, more or less is a uniform color. Um, there's definitely some white on the face um, and some dark spots around the muzzle and a dark tip on the tail that we'll talk about later. But for the most part, they're kind of a uniform tan or reddish brown. But while they only have one color, so to speak, um, they also have many, many names. So some of those include mountain lion, cougar, puma, catamount, ghost cat, panther, and even mountain screamer, which is probably my favorite. Um, but these are all describing the same species. Um, and we'll look at a little later how big of a range these animals have. And that's uh, that has a lot to do with the fact that they have so many different names because so many different people from different cultures um, have direct experiences with these animals. All right, so how do you know if you're looking at a mountain lion, if you see one on the trail? Um, so here are a couple of things to point out. Uh, number one, the thing that I tell people to focus on, if you have a chance, you can see the backside of the animal, look for that tail because there's not really anything locally that has a tail quite like a mountain lion. Um, it's two and a half to three feet long, tends to have a darker tip, sometimes even black. And it's long enough that if the lion is standing up, that tail can easily touch the ground. Um, there are several other mammal species that have long tails, but not quite that long. And that's a good thing to look for. Does it look like it can actually touch the ground? So again, they have that mostly uniform fur. It's typically pretty short. Um, and they have this dark mustache on the face um, that you can kind of see here in this photo. They also have dark lines that kind of run down to the eyes and then directly under the eyes, which is a really pretty and interesting marking that um, you might not notice if you don't focus too much. Their hips typically are higher than their shoulders. Um, and that has to do with those really powerful legs that they use to jump on prey from cover. Um, so those are a couple of things to look for to, to determine if you're looking at a mountain lion. Oh, and real quick too, that mostly uniform color, uh, if it's a juvenile mountain lion or if it's a kitten, um, it won't actually be that uniform. And we'll look at a couple of photos and examples of that a little later. In fact, here we have a, a nice shot of a mountain lion kitten. Um, that illustrates that point very nicely. And you can even see that black mustache there as well. Um, so when mountain lions are young, uh, this gets into some of that camouflage that Aurora was discussing earlier. Um, they are pretty darn helpless and they rely on their mothers to take care of them. So they'll be left behind in den sites. The mom will go out, get food, come and eat that food, and then nurse until the kittens are old enough to eat it themselves. Um, and to keep them safe in those dens, they make sure that they have this nice camouflage, right? So it's a nice adaptation for them um, to where if you found this animal and it was holding really still, and you might not even notice that it's there. Another kind of interesting thing about young mountain lions, the kittens, is that they have these really bright blue eyes. Um, and eventually those turn into like more of a vibrant gold color as they age. So female mountain lions at around two to three years old um, can give birth. That's when they're uh, sexually reproductive um, and they can have one to four spotted kittens. Uh, the mothers will stay with those kittens for 12 to 16 months. So about a year, year and a half. And at that point, the young will disperse and young male mountain lions will have to leave the territory that they came from because typically their fathers will occupy that territory and male lions can be really, really uh, territorial and get into some very nasty fights over territories, uh, sometimes even leading to the death of mountain lions. Uh, females, young dispersing females will typically take a small portion of their mother's territory, um, not always, but typically, and then stick around that area. And the territories can range quite a bit. So males can have uh, home ranges of up to 90 square miles, um, and females can have home ranges of up to 30 square miles. Of course, it depends on availability of habitat and how many other mountain lions are in the area, um, but that's sort of the maximum. And non-breeding mountain lions are typically solitary, so they travel and eat and do everything by themselves for the most part. That's not always the case, but usually that's the case. And they can live from eight to 10 years tops in the wild, uh, but most 
do not make it that long. And we'll talk a little bit about some threats later on. So what is it that mountain lions eat? Um, well, they are obligate carnivores. So that means unlike me or you who might be able to decide, hey, I want to be a vegan or a vegetarian. I'm going to decide I don't want to eat meat. Uh, mountain lions don't have that decision. They can't make that decision. They have to eat meat to survive. And that's uh, the case for pretty much all felids or members of the cat family. Um, so mostly what they eat here in our region is Colombian black-tailed deer. Um, and they're really, really good at, uh, at finding and capturing deer. Uh, but they will also eat other species like coyotes and foxes, wild boar, turkey, rodents, um, and even, uh, unfortunately, occasionally domestic animals like pets and livestock. Um, some interesting recent research by the Puma Project found that mountain lions will actually gravitate towards eating smaller animals, smaller prey, um, when they are near areas with a lot of people. And the reason is, if a person happens upon a mountain lion that has a, a prey item, um, it's very likely that the lion will abandon it, and then it loses out on all the energy it took to try and take that prey item and capture it in the first place, and it loses that food source. So if they try to eat smaller animals that are easy to consume, so you can eat it real quickly, um, it's less likely that they'll be chased off by a person. So in areas where there's a lot of people, they'll eat more raccoons and turkeys and things like that. All right, so next, it's really important that we talk about why we want to care about mountain lions. Why does it matter that mountain lions are out there on the landscape? Well, we talked a lot about deer already and how they will consume deer. And that is one of the, the nice benefits of having mountain lions around is that they act as a check on the population of deer. And that can reduce things like herbivory, right? So deer are out there munching on shrubs and trees and grass. And if there are more deer around, they're going to impact those resources a little bit more. In addition, when mountain lions take a deer, um, what they'll typically do is drag it away from a trail or a road, find a nice secluded spot, and they'll actually cover it over with soil and leaf litter, um, and they'll cache it, and they'll come back and forth throughout, uh, sometimes up to a week, depending on the size of the deer, but about a week for an adult deer, a uh, mountain lion will feed on that. And during that time, um, little critters will come in, uh, fungus, bacteria, bugs, skunks, weasels, foxes, coyotes, and they'll take little bits and pieces of that animal. Um, and then nutrients from the, the decomposing deer will then enter into the soil and help enrich plant life. So they're part of this really great uh, system that recycles these nutrients. Um, and it's very important to have them on the landscape. Another reason that it's great to have mountain lions around is that they actually cut down on the prevalence of Lyme disease. Um, Lyme disease is a tick-borne illness um, that people can get, um, and it can be quite serious. Um, and it actually has several different hosts. So it will um, be in uh, small mammal species that mountain lions eat. It'll be in deer. Um, and then it will enter into the bodies of ticks. If the tick bites you, you could get Lyme disease. Now, when mountain lions are around, there typically are fewer deer. So that eliminates one reservoir for Lyme disease. And then also, uh, they will limit the amount of space that smaller wildlife will travel in. So those raccoons and foxes and coyotes and things like that typically won't move quite as much if there is a lion nearby. And that means they have less of a chance of encountering a diseased tick and then getting exposed to Lyme. Um, on the east coast of the United States, where lions have been extirpated or removed, uh, we have quite a few, uh, quite a lot more prevalence of Lyme disease than we do here on the west coast. So if you get bit by a tick, you can thank a mountain lion that it's less likely to carry Lyme disease. All right, this gets back at a couple of the points that Aurora was making about um, trying to just be really observant and look out for signs of wildlife. So my job uh, includes conducting surveys, looking for wildlife. I'm out in the field quite a bit. 
Um, and the only times that I've ever seen a mountain lion in the wild were when we were actively trying to trap and collar the mountain lions for research. So I've never myself, even though I'm out in the field all the time, I've never seen a mountain lion just wandering free in the wild. But what I do see a lot of the times, almost everywhere I go in the Santa Cruz mountains, um, are tracks and signs and scrapes and things like that from mountain lions. So I know that they're all around us almost all the time, um, but they're really good at avoiding people. So it's hard to find them. So we've got here a couple images of some beautiful mountain lion tracks. But how do you know if this is a mountain lion track and not a coyote or a bobcat? So things to look for. One is this distinctive M shape that you see in the back pad of the track. Um, so you think M for mountain lion, right? That's one thing to, to note. And then the other thing to note is that they have four kind of teardrop shaped toe pads in the front of the, of the track um, that you can see here. The other thing is that just like your domestic cat that you might have at home, mountain lions and other felids have retractable claws and they like to keep those claws sharp and clean. So when they're walking through mud and dirt, things like that, they hold those claws into their paw um, and you won't see them register in the dirt. So you don't see any claw marks in this track. Another good indication that it's a mountain lion. Uh, you'll see that there's this weird yellow piece of paper um, on the side of the tracks. So this is a write in the rain notebook um, that I carry with me everywhere that I go. Um, and I make notes on it. And one of the nice things is it has a little scale on it. So that can tell me when I put it next to a track how big it is. So if you're looking at a track that you think might be a mountain lion, um, an adult track would be about three to four inches long and about three to five inches wide. And measuring that track is really helpful because it can help you decide if you're looking at a lion print or something smaller like a bobcat print, which will look very, very similar, but just uh, be a lot smaller. Okay, another thing that you might find out on the landscape is scrapes and scat. Um, so this is really a way that mountain lions communicate with each other and say, hey, this is my territory. I've been here. Um, and what they basically do is find a nice little spot with some leaf litter and some loose soil, and they push back with their hind legs, and then they pee or poop right there um, and leave some scent behind. So some of the scent comes from their droppings, and then some of it actually comes from pheromones that are released from their feet as they're scraping into the soil. And those pheromones actually are way more persistent on the landscape than the pee or poop might be. Um, so that's a really good way long term for them to say, hey, I'm here, and this is my spot. And if they're another male mountain lion coming through, they're going to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, so you can look out for things like this. Uh, mountain lion scat is large, quite large. Um, it can be six to 15 inches long. It's usually segmented. Um, and it can be blunt or maybe pointed at the end, sort of depends. Uh, and they often will be full of hair and bones, um, even deer hooves. I've actually even found uh, bobcat claws in mountain lion scat before, so kind of interesting. Um, but you won't see anything like vegetation in a bobcat or a mountain lion or bobcat scat, actually, uh, because again, they're obligate carnivores. All right, so how big is a lion? Um, so this little chart here shows the difference in size between mountain lions, bobcats, domestic cats, and people. Um, adult male mountain lions can be uh, anywhere from 120 to 160 pounds, so pretty darn big. Um, adult females are quite a bit smaller, 85 to 115 pounds, and I often hear people describe them as being about the size of a large German shepherd when they see them on the trails. So mountain lions are really incredible predators, um, very capable of taking down large species like deer. Um, and they have some nice tools to help them with that. Uh, one such tool is those retractable claws that we talked about. Um, those can be you know, four inches long and they keep them very sharp. Uh, wound marks from these claws in 
prey species look a lot like a very clean, um, concise cut from a knife. Um, so it won't look tattered like you might see if a coyote was going after something. And then they have these incredibly powerful jaws with large prominent canines um, that enable them to easily take down deer. Um, typically lions are hunting around dawn and dusk and they are ambush predators. So they'll hide in brush or up in trees waiting for something to come by and then pounce on them from cover. Um, but if they are not able to get them right away, they're also very good at chasing after prey. So they can run uh, up to 50 miles per hour in a sprint. They can jump up to 15 feet vertically, um, which a lot of times kind of comes into play when people ask about trying to fence in their yard to keep mountain lions and things like that out. Well, you're going to need a 15 foot high fence in that instance, and you're going to need to make sure there aren't any trees that go over that fence because a lion could easily traverse that. Um, they can also jump horizontally 32 feet across. There's a really cool video that you can find online of a mountain lion clearing a river channel in one leap. And 32 feet is about the size of a standard average road width. Um, so they are quite fast. All right, so now that we know a little bit about mountain lions and kind of what they can do and what they look like and the importance of them on the landscape, let's again play a little game, have a little activity here. So in this activity, I'm going to give you some information about some animals that look a lot like mountain lions that sometimes people mistake for mountain lions. Um, and they'll give me a call and say, hey, I saw a mountain lion and this is what it looked like and we got to figure out what it is. So um, what we'll do is I'll explain what these other animals look like, and then we'll have a little game to see if you can determine what we're looking at with some cool wildlife photos. So our first cougar copycat is the bobcat, or lynx rufus. Um, some distinguishing characteristics here are they have ear tufts, these little wisps that kind of stick up on the tips of the ears. Um, they have that short tail, that's where the name bobcat comes from, the bobbed tail. And it usually has sort of a white or black tip to it. And it can be about six, inch, six inches long. So it's not stubby like, um, you know, some, some domestic dogs that maybe have their tails docked, where it's just like a couple inches. It's about six inches. Um, and then it has, bobcats have these really beautiful stripes and spotted patterns all over their body um, that you can see here in this great photo. They also have fur that kind of flares out from their neck that almost looks like mutton chops, um, which are super cool. All right, our next lion lookalike is the coyote, Canis latrans. Um, they have a very long, narrow muzzle, um, like most domestic dogs, especially, again, like a German shepherd. Um, they have that really bushy tail. You see that the, the hair on that tail is much longer than the hair that we saw on the mountain lion photo earlier. Um, the tail is usually about one and a half feet long. Of course, it varies. Um, then they have those slender legs, and they've got really broad pointed ears as well. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to play this game. And you can either just hold it in your head what you think the answer is, or you can write it into the chat. Up to you. Um, so look at the photo. Try and identify the critter. Pay attention to scale. I've included scale in these photos to kind of help you out. And then look for that long tail because that's a good giveaway. All right, so critter number one. So this has some interesting patterning on its fur. Its tail to me is pretty long, um, maybe longer than a bobcat, not sure. It's about two feet in length from head to tail. Um, so yeah, that's critter number one. So I can't see the comments at the moment, but I'll, I'll move on at the end. We'll discuss the answers. Now we've got critter number two. So this was taken from a wildlife camera at Russian Ridge open space preserve in San Mateo County. Um, and there's actually two animals in this photo, two of the same species. There's one kind of closer that has that scale of three and a half feet and then one a bit behind it facing the other direction. Um, so looks like they're pretty low to the ground. They've got long muzzles. They've got pretty broad pointed ears. And the individual in the back has a very bushy tail. 
that's pointed down to, towards the ground. So that's number two. So far, these people could take your job. Oh yeah! Oh no! <laughs> well, so, that's that's good to hear. So so they're they're doing they're doing very well in their identifications. Excellent. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, we we definitely like to hear that people know what they're looking at when they when they find something out on the trail, and it means that they're just being very observant. So that's great. All right, the next animal um, has more of a pattern going on. Has sort of a shorter tail seeing some tufts at the tip of the ear, and this is about three feet in length. And then we'll move on to our final animal. And you'll notice that this picture, the next one I'm gonna show, is uh, in the same exact spot. So the next animal will be a, a little bit different size than the one we're looking at here. There we go. But it's in the same location to give you a good scale reference. Um, so this one, has a nice long black tip tail. Um, looks like it's pretty uniform in color. And if you guessed that this was a mountain lion, you got it. Good job. So we have uh, photo number one, domestic cat. Photo number two uh, is the coyotes. Photo number three were a bobcat. And then the final photo was a juvenile mountain lion. Um, you can see some kind of white spotting on the fur. Um, so it's still kind of retaining some of those spots from when it was uh, a young kitten. So I'm glad to hear everyone did well with that. I hope it was a, a good way to keep everyone engaged. All right, so now that we know what a mountain lion looks like and how to identify it, what do you do if you encountered a mountain lion on the trail? And really, if you only remember one thing from this presentation, I would like it to be this just because I want to make sure that you're safe and that the mountain lions are safe as well. Because when we respond in the way that I'm going to discuss, what we're telling the mountain lion is, is that people are dangerous. And to mountain lions, um, people definitely are dangerous. We're one of the most dangerous things out there for them. So if you find a mountain lion on the trail, first of all, you've had some amazing luck. Um, and that's great. And I, I hope one day that I'm lucky enough to find one just wandering across the trail. But if you see one and it seems like it's close to you um, and doesn't just immediately run off of the trail, which is typically how they react, what you want to do is face the lion, stand your ground, and absolutely do not run away. Um, if the lion does not flee and is still there on the trail looking at you, that's when you want to make a lot of noise, right? So you're shouting, you're waving your arms, shaking your keys, um, making yourself look as big as you can. And again, not turning around, not trying to run, standing your ground. If you have children, keep them close um, or even pick them up. Try to do so without bending over uh, because bending over can expose yourself to an attack. Usually mountain lions are going for the neck. Um, and then if you actually got attacked by a mountain lion, uh, you would want to fight back. So it's not like you hear with uh, some people saying that, um, you know, if you get attacked by a grizzly bear, you want to pretend that you're dead. Uh, with a mountain lion, you want to fight back. And people are actually successfully able to uh, fight off a mountain lion in past instances with as little as a ballpoint pen. Um, so they don't expect to get to uh, have to fight for their prey quite so much. Uh, um, now, if you want to just avoid being around mountain lions um, and lower your risk, what you can do is try not to go hiking around dawn and dusk when they're most active and going after prey. Um, and then make sure that if you're wearing headphones like I am right now, pop one out so that you can just be more aware of your surroundings. Um, and then hiking in groups is also good because mountain lions tend to avoid groups of people. Usually when you're in a group, you're talking, you're having conversations, and lions can easily hear that and then avoid you on the trail. Um, if you ever do encounter an aggressive mountain lion you can, and you're on mid-pen properties, you can call our ranger line um, with the phone number listed below. And if you ever experience an aggressive mountain lion anywhere else, you can just call 911 um, and someone will respond. All right. So other things to note for keeping mountain lions safe and keeping ourselves safe are that, you know, you typically think mountain lions 
are most likely going to be out in the forest, right? They're going to be out in the mountains. Uh, but that's not always the case. In fact, if you happen to live pretty close to uh, open space or a park, uh, mountain lions very likely are moving through your neighborhoods on occasion. Uh, they're totally capable of moving through small neighborhoods to get to other locations and have ended up in places like downtown Mountain View and San Francisco on many occasions. Usually when this happens, it's a young dispersing male that's trying to find new territory away from other dominant males. And when there isn't a lot of territory available and most of it's already taken, the lions really have no choice but to go through areas with a lot of people and through neighborhoods. Um, so to keep them safe, you can do things like making sure you're not attracting wildlife by putting out pet food, uh, making sure you're not feeding deer or any other wildlife that might attract lions. Remember, if you bring their prey in, they're more likely to come. You can also put up fencing to keep deer out. You can trim brush so there's no hiding places for lions, uh, making sure that you're not leaving small children or pets outside. You can put in motion sensitive lighting or even sprinklers around your house. Um, and also again, don't let those pets outside at dawn and dusk or leave dogs outside or dogs or cats outside overnight unattended. Um, you can follow the link there for more information on some safety tips to keep you and mountain lion safe. Now we'll talk a little bit more about their range and distribution. So lions are amazing creatures. They have the largest distribution of any land mammal in the Americas. And this really speaks to how amazingly adaptable lions are. So they can survive in conditions from the high Andes uh, to the Amazon rainforests to the Arctic tundra of Canada. And this of course also has played a role again in having so many different names because they interact with so many different cultures of people. Um, another thing to point out uh, when looking at this map is that lions are not around on the east, east coast of North America, with the exception of Florida, where there is a small population of Florida panther um, that are critically endangered, unfortunately. Uh, so this did not used to be the case. Um, and it was only through uh, wide range hunting and removal of mountain lions that we lost the populations in those areas. So we've got some really fantastic habitat here in the Santa Cruz Mountains in the Bay Area for mountain lions. So when you're looking at this map, basically the darker that orange color is, the more suitable the habitat is for mountain lions. Um, and the Santa Cruz Mountain Mountains has some great places for mountain lions to be, and we, we see a lot of them in this region. Um, but they are pretty isolated, uh, both by developed areas and uh, San Francisco Bay and the Pacific Ocean. So there's a lot of geographical boundaries and borders that are keeping them in, um, and then a lot of development that's keeping them isolated. So these maps are pretty interesting. They came from some collared mountain lions that we have at a number of preserves at Midpen. Um, where we're working with the Santa Cruz Puma Project to better understand how mountain lions uh, interact um, in preserves where there are a lot of people. So this is pretty close to Cupertino at Rancho San Antonio. And this is a female mountain lion who is about two and a half years old now. Um, and her designation is 115F. Um, and this shows basically her home range. So these are the areas that she most often occupies. And she'll pop into Rancho San Antonio and, you know, in deeper into Montebello um, on occasion, but this is her prime habitat. The next photo shows a male mountain lion that we've also collared for the, as part of this study. And this is 118M. He is a very fascinating mountain lion. Uh, he's estimated to be about eight years old, which is at the higher end of the life expectancy for mountain lions. Uh, so a very well-established male. Um, again, you can see Cupertino and Rancho San Antonio. Um, and you can see here that the range for this individual is about three to four times larger than what we saw with that young female mountain lion. 
So the status of lions has changed quite a bit through time. Um, I mentioned that in the East Coast, most of the mountain lions have been removed with the exception of the Florida panther. Um, and that, again, is because in the past, um, they were sought after and hunted. So in 1907 through 1963, uh, the federal and state governments would actually pay people to go and shoot mountain lions and bring in pelts um, and collect a reward. And then they became a non-game mammal in the 60s. Late 60s became a game mammal again, meaning you could go and hunt them with a hunting license. And in California in 1990s, they became a specially protected species. And just recently in 2020, they were listed as a candidate species under the California Endangered Species Act uh, because their populations seem to be at risk, uh, mostly due to low levels, low numbers of, of individual mountain lions and poor genetic diversity um, in certain populations throughout the state. So there are some estimates out there about how many mountain lions we have um, statewide and Cal Fish and Wildlife that manages populations of different animals, including mountain lions, um, estimates that there's four to 6,000 in the state. Um, and they're working on a more accurate estimate right now, um, but that's the best one that we have so far. And in the Santa Cruz mountains, um, a recent genetic study showed that we probably have 33 to 66 adult mountain lions total um, throughout the whole region of the Santa Cruz mountains. So some of the big uh, drivers of impacts to mountain lions that influence population sizes, uh, one is depredation and poaching. So depredation is basically when someone can get a permit saying that they can go and shoot a mountain lion because it attacked uh, livestock or um, a domestic animal like a pet. Poaching is when somebody illegally shoots a mountain lion without a permit. Um, the other big driver is roadkill. If you look at this map, you can see, unfortunately, uh, images, uh, data points of lions that have been killed on roadways throughout the Bay Area. Um, so that's a, a huge driver. And then habitat loss and genetic isolation, as well as the use of rodenticides that will accumulate up and end up uh, impacting predator species like mountain lions, coyotes, and bobcats. Other biological factors that um, aren't related so much to humans include the prevalence of diseases, um, infanticide, which is where mountain lions may actually kill their own offspring, and then territorial disputes where male lions may fight each other. Um, often that will even lead to the death of a lion. And then things like prey availability. So if there's not much food around, then lions will be less fit and more likely to um, not persist and not, not continue living. So in the Santa Cruz Mountains in particular, um, this is a chart from 2014 to 2018, the top causes of lion mortality are strikes by vehicles, so getting hit on the road, um, and those depredation permits being issued in response to loss of livestock and domestic animals. So these are two issues that MidPen is trying to address um, in a couple of different ways. One of the most important ways that uh, we're helping to try and address the issue of habitat fragmentation is uh, continuing to preserve open space. Um, so each property that we that comes into our possession that we're able to manage for the public, um, we are then saving from being developed and ending up uh, having a greater loss of mountain lion habitat. Uh, another project that we're working on that's specific to mountain lions and other animals being able to safely get across large barriers is a Highway 17 regional wildlife uh, crossing. So this is right near Lexington Reservoir, south of the town of Los Gatos. And we've identified a number of suitable locations to put in what is essentially a tunnel um, that mountain lions and other wildlife can safely pass through uh, so that they can easily get from the southern portion of the Santa Cruz Mountains into the northern portion of the Santa Cruz Mountains and beyond. We also work a lot with researchers like the UCSC Puma Project, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Bay Area Puma Project to better understand lion behavior, ecology, 
movement and population dynamics. Um, one really interesting study that came out recently from the Santa Cruz Puma Project found that lions will avoid areas um, where speakers were playing human voices. So again, another example of mountain lions not really wanting to stay around people and having a natural response of avoiding us. We do a lot of education and outreach as well here at MidPen. This is me back in, I think, 2017. Um, doing an outreach table at Rancho San Antonio, um, just trying to let people know that mountain lions are out there on the landscape and how to be safe. We also have some really great wildlife camera research going on. We have a wildlife photo array at Rancho San Antonio that we've set up to better understand mountain lion occupancy and movement and habitat use. Um, these are some really cool photos that we received um, from some of our cameras in La Honda. So these are two juvenile mountain lions that are actually playing with each other, pouncing on each other. And then we also get really great information about breeding activity. So here's a beautiful female mountain lion with three young kittens wandering down a trail. One thing that's important for us to keep in mind when we talk about images of mountain lions is that in this day and age, it's so much easier to get a hold of a high quality camera that you can set up on your door, like a little um, you know, security camera on your door or a wildlife camera that you can put in your backyard. And it's pretty often that on sites like Nextdoor, you'll hear people say like, hey, we saw, we saw a mountain lion and then the next neighbor down the street also saw a mountain lion. And maybe a few weeks later, somebody sees a lion again. And then before you know it, everybody's thinking that there's this deluge of mountain lions and they're everywhere and the population is out of control. Uh, but really what you probably had was one mountain lion that crossed through a neighborhood and passed through a couple of cameras. Maybe it came back a few weeks later to get to another open space. Um, so what I basically want people to know from this is um, just take the images that you get and the stories that you hear about mountain lion observations with a grain of salt and know that just because people are seeing a lot of photos of mountain lions and it's so much easier to share them through social media doesn't mean that there are more mountain lions than there used to be. So uh, talking a bit about lion attacks on people, just so that everyone is aware, um, they are incredibly rare. So you're much more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to be attacked by a mountain lion. Um, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. If you're hiking anywhere in the Bay Area in open space, you're in mountain lion habitat. And while you may have never seen a mountain lion, if you've hiked in open space before, odds are very good that a mountain lion has seen you and done everything it could to avoid you. Um, but on occasion, there are instances where lions do attack people. Um, and it is a very unfortunate circumstance that we want to avoid at all costs. So there have been 18 confirmed attacks in California since 1986, since Cal, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife has kept track of this. Um, unfortunately, three of those were fatal to humans. The rest were non-fatal attacks. Um, but I do want to point out that in all of these instances, Cal Department of Fish and Wildlife responds to these attacks by uh, removing the mountain lion, so euthanizing the mountain lion um, to make sure that they can protect public safety. Um, so almost every one of these resulted in the death of a mountain lion, which is, again, really unfortunate and something that we want to avoid. So that brings us back to the two photos that we were looking at before. So to me, this first photo um, is not the scary picture. And the reason for that is this is kind of normal mountain lion behavior to me. This is a, a lion um, that is out on a preserve that's not actually open to the public. Um, you know, I know some context to the photo, so I'm cheating a little bit here. Um, but the lion in this case is actually at a latrine site. So this is a location where lions will put scrapes um, and mark territory. And the reason that its head is held low is probably because it's sniffing to smell what other lions and other species have been in the area. Um, again, you can see some of that scat on the ground behind it. And then back to this really beautiful shot. 
Um, so again, this is actually taken by a preserved user. Um, we, we have had instances at Rancho San Antonio of people literally trying to take selfies with mountain lions behind them, uh, which I cannot advise against more strongly. Uh, you really don't want to do something like that. Never, never want to turn your back on an animal like that. Um, this was taken with a nice zoom lens, a good telephoto lens. So the preserve user was not that close to the lion, um, but it definitely was, they were close enough that the lion knew that these people were there. Um, and clearly the, this lion is very relaxed and comfortable on the trail. Um, so the reason that this is alarming is not because I think that the lion in this photo is going to harm the person taking the picture, um, but it seems that this lion is not acting in the way that we would expect. Um, it's not, not showing its normal fear in response to a human being close by that wants to run away. And that is why when we see a mountain lion, we wanna stand our ground, make a lot of noise and reinforce that feeling that people are scary. Um, because as we discussed earlier, uh, people are the leading cause of mountain lion mortalities. So when you act that way, when you see a mountain lion and you try to reinforce that people are frightening, you're helping protect yourself and you're helping protect that beautiful mountain lion um, that we wanna see on the landscape. So these are some sources that I cited throughout the talk. Always have to have those as a biologist. Um, and then these are some resources that if you wanna take a moment and do a little screen grab or something, um, you can go ahead and, and look at these locations for more information on mountain lions. And with that, I will pass it back um, and we'll open it up for questions. Great, thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, that was sharing. awesome, Matt. So much information. And it's always good to learn about the wildlife at parks and preserves that you're going to, to not only for your own safety, for the animal safety, but you know, we're all visitors in these parks as well. Uh, so it's, I think it's always really important to learn a little bit about the park that you're heading into. So thank you for providing that for us. Um, Absolutely. There, there was a couple questions. Uh, if we can take just a couple minutes to answer some of these questions. I know we're a little bit over the time, but um, one of the questions was, can people perceive the scent of the pheromones? And I think that was in regards to when you were talking about them uh, marking with their scents. Yeah, um, you can if you if you know what to sniff for. <laughs> um, I uh, I want to caution you about that though. I I know quite a few trackers that will will get right down in there and in a scrape and and sniff. Um, but again, that's that's where they're also urinating, <laughs> so you're gonna get a lot of that. Um, but the the smell from just from the feet of the mountain lion, um, I've been able to to smell that in person with a, a lion that we um, were collaring. And it's a sort of a earthy, sweet smell. Um, it's very nice, <laughs> uh, to be honest. Um, but yeah, if you if you got there quickly enough um, and there wasn't urine all over the place, <laughs> you might be able to smell that from a scrape. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Um, another question was, uh, in regards to the slide where you showed the the different numbers of mountain lions getting hit by cars. And mm -hmm. so someone at least noticed that uh, the number of mountain lions hit by cars in 2016 was much higher compared to other years and was just wondering why that could be. Ooh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. You know, we, we would need to kind of develop a study around determining the causes and factors that play into road mortalities. It could be anything from there being, you know, a pulse of dispersing males that year, um, or maybe for whatever reason, there were more people on the road. Uh, some things that could drive animals to disperse more would be like a, a wildfire or something like that could drive them from one area to another. Um, those are all potentials, but I, I can't say for sure what, what caused that spike in the Santa Cruz mountains in that year. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Yeah, so those are the two questions that I saw. Um, lots of people just, again, uh, saying thank you to you, uh, saying, you know, those two pictures that you showed, a lot of people were actually saying that they were cute and weren't too alarmed by them. <laughs> uh, so, um, and like Sydney had mentioned earlier, when you had us play that game of identifying the different cats, lots of people were on it. So uh, thank you all for participating in that. And again, thank you, Matt, for such a great presentation. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, always, always fun. Uh, please invite me, invite me again. I'd, I'd love to talk that sometime or any other wildlife that you guys might be interested in. Of and I learned something new also. I don't think I've heard, I've heard Matt talk uh, about mountain lions a lot. And I don't think I had heard the connection with Lyme disease and uh, ticks. So that was something new for me. So you do learn something new every day. And Thanks, Aurora um, and Latino Outdoors for inviting us to uh, work with you on this. And uh, it's a great partnership that uh, we're, we're really proud of having worked with Latino Outdoors for so many years and looking forward to another great year. And hopefully we'll be out outdoors together soon. <laughs> yes. yes, definitely. Please, everyone, keep an eye out for upcoming events, uh, particularly in partnership with Mid Pen. Uh, we are planning to hopefully have uh, plenty of outdoor in-person ones uh, and then a couple other virtual ones as well. So please stay connected with us, again, on our Facebook group, our LatinaOutdoors.org website, or our Instagram page uh, to keep uh, an eye out for those events. So thank you, everyone. And great. yeah, have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bye. Bye.